Put this in here. Okay, I've got that to be back into a couple of things here. <laughs> okay, all right, uh, here we go. Talking about photographing flowers and I, of a lot of us who are nature photographers, I guess flowers is one of our favorite subjects. Usually we're always looking for good places to photograph flowers. And, uh, you know, uh, usually when I start talking with flowers to a lot of groups, and I think your group's a little more experienced people who are in here, but uh, they automatically jump to macro flowers, tiny things. And certainly that is, one of the areas, but there's also a lot of really big flowers out there to photograph uh, as well. This hibiscus here is uh, actually one from, I took this at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens Gainesville campus, which if you haven't visited it yet, that's another excellent place to go to photograph flowers. And uh, it's really been developing uh, they're adding another big section. I hope, hopefully, will be open next year. Uh, so that's one to keep in mind uh, for a good location. And again, there is the small flowers, stuff like this that actually grows in my front yard. And I confess that I don't even know what the name of this particular one is. But it's very tiny. Probably the flower itself may be a quarter of an inch long. So it's this one would fall definitely into the macro category of shooting them. <clears throat> and then we run into the situations, and I think, you know, photographing single flowers is fairly easy. Uh, figuring out how you want to photograph whole groups or fields of flowers, to me, becomes a more complicated thing of trying to compose those so they're pleasing. And uh, use a variety of lenses for doing this, sometimes wide angle, sometimes telephoto, just depends on how you want to uh, do the scene and uh, with them. So they can be a little tricky. So uh, talking about the equipment that I use when I'm shooting flowers, uh, I'm currently still using uh, some Canon cameras, T7, T8, and the new R7, which I'm quite pleased with. Uh, if any of you are familiar with that, that's the one of the new mirrorless cameras from Canon. And I'll, the, probably the two most common lenses that I use for photographing flowers are my Canon 70 to 300 and my Canon macro. As I said, depending on situation, sometimes I'll be using my Canon 10 to 18 and uh, Canon Canon is just re releasing, for those who might be Canon mirrorless shooters, uh, especially the R7, Canon is just releasing their Canon RFS 10 to 18 lens, one of a group of three new lenses they're putting out. Uh, my Tamron 18 to 200, my Canon 100 to 400, my Canon 55 to 250 are ones that I use a lot uh, for photographing flowers and close up things. and. Uh, I think it comes as a little bit of a surprise to some people when I put my equipment list out there and they see all those 300 and 400 millimeter lens things. And that's not what comes to mind for a lot of people when they're shooting flowers, uh, but probably use those a great deal. Of course, for getting really, really close, you have a number of options. Uh, when you're doing this, uh, the macro lenses, of course, which go down to a one-to-one -one ratio. When you're shooting, you have your close-up filters, uh, which screw on, of course, basically a magnifying glass. They work really well with some lenses. With zoom lenses, they can be a little tricky, but uh, I know some photographers who do a lot of flower photography using them on uh, some of their zoom lenses to get a little closer. Extension tubes, another uh, way of pushing some of your lenses out a little far farther and getting even closer. Uh, working distance can become a problem with using those. And then there's the reverse lens rings. Uh, this is one a lot of people don't know about. You can take like your 50 millimeter lens and flip it around backwards and shoot through it and it becomes 
uh, a pretty pretty good macro lens. I have an old Leica 50 millimeter lens that I use. Canon and Nikon both make reverse rings that screw onto the front just like a filter would and then it'll mount onto the camera body. Uh, the downside of this is you doing that is for macro or close up on uh, flowers or anything else is you really need a, a manual aperture, uh, an older lens with a manual aperture because you're no longer linked. And you know, when our electronics aren't talking to each other, it makes it a little bit more difficult. Uh, when you're doing it. So there's a number of ways you can get close when you need to. One thing I always point out to be a little bit of aware of when you're using all of these different attachments, though, is uh, you do run into some chromatic aberrations with close-up filters, extension tubes, even some of your zoom lenses that cover great distance, you know, like, you know, 18 to 300, 18 to 400. Uh, those type of distances on either end of that scale, our zoom lenses are always sharpest in the middle ranges. You can run into what's called fringing or chromatic aberrations on high contrast edges. And it's always worse the further from the center of the frame you get out when you're doing it. Doesn't mean you can't use some of those attachments, but just something to be aware of. Uh, and when you see it, uh, you don't have to panic. Uh, Lightroom Photoshop will allow you to clean up a lot of this kind of stuff. But uh, it's going to happen with some of those things. But I always tell everybody, especially my new students and everything who are really into the flowers and macro thing, that at some point you're going to want to just invest in a macro lens. And, uh, of course, Canon and Nikon and Sony and Tamron and Sigma, all of these people have tremendous numbers of macro lenses and various focal lengths, usually, especially uh, Canon and Nikon. Uh, Going to have them starting. Canon for a while had one that was 35 millimeter macro going all the way up to 180 or 200. So pretty wide range in the macro lenses. Uh, little focus close. And Another thing about focusing close, that one-to-one -one relationship, uh, we don't always have to get that close. We can have the flower or whatever uh, macro subject we have more in context rather than just trying to fill the frame uh, with that one thing. And sometimes that can make a more interesting composition, uh, I think, than really just going all the way in really, really tight uh, on things. And that's a distinction. This is part of why I say people are sometimes surprised by some of the lenses I use for flower photography. Uh, true macro lens, the little plant that's on the right-hand side of the screen here is called the pool sprite. They grow like on top of Stone Mountain and Arabia Mountain and some of the vernal pools. From tip to tip of lens is maybe an inch. Very, very tiny. So to fill a frame with a subject like that, you definitely need a macro lens. But the primrose that's on the left-hand side of the screen is probably two and a half to three inches across. That we can use our longer lenses definitely and still fill the frame with something like that. So we don't always need a macro lens uh, when do it, dealing with flowers. It's not always necessary with that. The tripod, of course, uh, one of those pieces of equipment that photographers uh, love to hate. We love the results when we use them. We hate carrying them around. But uh, particularly macro work, I do use my tripod uh, a lot with that. I do a lot more handheld. I think all of us probably do with the ability to use slightly higher ISOs to a good quality and the image stabilization quality that's in some of the cameras and lenses now. We get away with a lot more handheld than we used to for sure, but the, the tripod is still really valuable piece of equipment. So uh, a lot of different manufacturers out there today, my, most of mine, and I have a closet full of them, Manfrotto's, Benro's, and Photos mostly. 
uh, the ones that I have, but a lot of good ones out there these days. Some of the other stuff that I use when I'm photographing flowers, always good to have a knee pad or knee pads or something to kneel on, a garden pad will work. Uh, photographing in places like Stone Mountain, Arabia Mountain, the ground's pretty hard. Uh, your knees will appreciate it uh, with that. Uh, in the field, I often use reflectors like the upper right here uh, to bounce light into things. I don't use a lot of flash in the field occasionally, but not, not too much uh, with that. Getting really, really low to the ground. A lot of our wildflowers are very low to the ground. Just a bean bag can come in handy for getting down really, really low. You can make your own. There are some that are sold. I think I actually have a slide in here. Uh, on one of those. So the reflectors, the diffusers, uh, also uh, this particular reflector here has a zip-on cover that has a diffuser in the middle. A diffuser will let light pass through, soften the light on the subject. Sometimes if we can't get out there for the early and late light, we want to keep shooting. We need to work on the light a little bit. And diffusers come in really handy. Uh, there's the store-bought ones, and then you can make your own just from some clear shower curtain and foam core. Tack it in and make uh, nice ones yourself uh, that work with that. Other things that come in handy in the <laughs> macro world, a lot of times what you see is not what's really going on. Uh, a lot of photographers, this is just the watchmaker's tools. Uh, that's been used, and this, this is actually not one of my photographs, but another photographer I know uh, who uses this type of stuff. But uh, uh, sometimes you can't get it any other way, and a lot of photographers will use tools like this uh, to uh, help them locate the flower in a more pleasing position and the background as well. The plant is a very popular tool for doing just this sort of thing, actually. And I do own several of these. Uh, the plant, as it's called, they can hold small reflectors. They can help. In the field, our biggest enemy is going to be wind when we're photographing this kind of subject matter. So if you can stabilize a flower, a leaf, or whatever you're trying to photograph in the field, they can come in very handy. Uh, most photographers I know own a couple of them. As photo equipment goes, they're relatively cheap uh, to own and can be extremely useful for lots of things in the field. When I do use lighting, added lighting in the field, I've become more and more a fan of the LED type lights. I like them because I can model with them in the field or even in the studio if I'm doing tabletop setups. For macro and flowers, I can use them and you can model in real time. Uh, the newer CN126 is a battery powered one. Uh, the Savage Luminous Pro is a charger one. It's about four by six inches. It's a fairly bigger one, uh, one of those. My favorite for the field is actually the Lytra Torch Cube, which fits basically in the palm of your hand. Uh, and charges on a USB charge, so you can charge it in your car or wherever uh, you need to uh, when you're out uh, with those. And these are all fairly reasonably expensive. In fact, I think I saw that Hunt's Photo and Video has the Sa uh, Savage Luminous Pro on special for like 39 bucks or something, which is a real steal for that because it was originally about 130 So it's a really good deal on it. You can control the intensity on it. You can control the temperature on it. It's a really good, small, uh, all-purpose LED light. With that. When I do use a pop-up flash for macro or close-up, I always try to diffuse it some way or other. The Gary Fong pop-up flash diffuser is one of the good ways to do this. The pop-up flash is going away on a lot of our newer cameras. Uh, my newest one doesn't have one on it uh, anymore. And uh, so that, that is something that's going away. Not the ideal location for added lighting anyway, straight on. But if you do use them, I suggest strongly diffusing them, especially for close-up. 
In fact, if you have a camera where you can control the intensity of the on camera flash, go in and turn it all the way down and diffuse it. Uh, so you get a nice soft fill with it. I mentioned uh, some of these smaller things in addition to the just the homemade bean bag. Several companies make the tabletop or very small mini tripods that they're called that can come in handy for the getting low stuff. The red pod is one that actually screws into the bottom of your camera. It actually has a mount on it. It's a, essentially a bean bag you buy. It also has a slot in the bottom of it. So if you're doing drive-by wildlife shooting, it'll sit on your window <laughs> in the car. So it comes in kind of handy as well uh, at times with it. Filters are always an interesting subject uh, in flower and close-up photography, just like everything else. In general, I don't use a lot of filters when I'm doing this kind of photography. Uh, the one that I will use occasionally is the polarizer. And that's primarily when I'm dealing with the kind of plant life like rhododendrons and magnolias and azaleas that have the really shiny leaves that tend to reflect a lot of light. As for the flowers themselves, the polarizer usually doesn't do too much. But if you have the surrounding greenery, sometimes that can be a real uh, a real plus. As far as filters in general, what you're looking at is pretty much what I carry these days. Polarizers, uh, the graduated neutral density filters, and the standard neutral density filters or variable neutral density filters, which are very popular these days. They rotate just like a polarizer and they just get lighter or darker depending on how far you go with them. Uh, not very useful for flower photography, but uh, that's primarily the ones I have in my bag uh, most of the time. So subject matter wise and photographing, to me, you know, we got a lot of rules and ideas in photography, but basically the, the big unbreakable rule is light. I always tell everybody, if you want to be a really good photographer, you have to be a student of light. Uh, that's what our subject is. No matter what we're photographing, it's always light. Uh, so you have to be a student of it. You have to pay attention to it. How's it falling on the subject? What kind of light works best for the subject matter you're shooting? For flower photography, bright overcast days tend to be pretty good days usually. You can work in brighter sunlight and early and late light, but uh, I like a nice, bright, overcast day uh, for doing this type of photography a lot of the time. And, you know, uh, hopefully for most of you guys, this is uh, old hat. Hopefully everybody understands what their light meter is showing them, how to get a good exposure in the camera. All of our light meters, of course, are trying to shove everything into the middle. And uh, I had a student today who asked me, said, well, my photos are kind of flat. They're, they're always coming out kind of flat. And I said, well, you know, what's the total range of the image? And he said, well, it's kind of all mid-tone. You know, the camera took everything, shoves it into the middle. And this is one of the reasons that a little post-processing uh, is sometimes necessary to get the richness out of images that you really want to have and then understanding how to get the correct exposure uh, when you're shooting uh, the old the old go-to is white snow of course uh, white snow shot at the zero on your scale is going to be gray it's not going to be white so you're going to open up a couple of stops usually for snow in here and if you think about your flowers in particular where do a lot of the colors fall? They're going to be softer colors. They're going to be whites, yellows, you know, pale blues, things like that. A lot of them are going to be on the plus side uh, for a good exposure with them. And then, you know, hopefully here's the old uh, chart that uh, I always use. Uh, hopefully everybody understands how all, all of this works. 
as complex as our computers are today, my new manual for the Canon R7 is 1,031 pages long, I think. It's ridiculous. But it all comes back to this. Uh, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. <clears throat> and this is how we work to apply for the scenes we're going to get. Assuming it, it's ISO 100 and you have a correct exposure or a zero exposure of 130th at 5.6, then everything else on this scale is also correct because it's all halves and doubles. F4 lets in twice as much light as 5.6, so I can have a faster shutter speed. F8 lets in half as much light as 5.6, so I need a longer shutter speed to balance it back out. By raising the ISO to 200, this becomes 1 1,000th, and everything shifts one place. So how you manipulate those numbers, how you apply depth of field and all of that, is how we end up with the images that we get. And of course, when you change one of those three numbers, you're doing exposure compensation. By changing one of the three, you're either going to make it lighter or darker, depending on whether you're letting in more light or less. But the, so that's the compensation. So when I say in certain situations we need to be at plus two, we're compensating. We're moving it into the plus two area with that. And this is the results of that in real time. At a meter reading of zero, white flowers, they're not white. They're very gray. At plus 1.5, now you have white with detail. And so that's, and I, I do have to say, I think digital is more forgiving than film. Uh, but I'm a big proponent of learn how to get it right in the camera, get as close as you can in the camera. I would always rather be out shooting than sitting at the computer trying to correct something uh, if I don't have to. So I rely a great deal on my histogram. Hopefully everybody is familiar with the histogram, familiar with what it is. It simply tells us what the total range in the image you're shooting uh, or capturing is. And in essence, digital cameras don't really see color. They see tone, and it's how they distribute those tones uh, over there that we're looking at in the histograms. And there's the two types of histograms, the lightness or brightness histogram and the RGB histogram. Those are the three colors we have to work with, really. And the lightness or brightness histogram is an average of these three. So I'm always looking, this is the view that I have on the back of my camera when I'm reviewing images when I'm shooting, because I want to know where this image is. If we look at the upper image here, you'll see that the red is blowing out, as we say, it's spiking on the right hand side, which is the highlight side. And you can see how washed out this particular image looks. In this case, in order to pull that red back away, from that right hand side, I have to go minus to one and a third, and that pulls it back in, and you start to see the richness in the reds again. This is kind of counterintuitive, uh, I think, for a lot of people. And if you're looking at just the bottom histogram, it looks very underexposed, but it's not really. And this is really important with flowers because so many of them fall in this red, orange, yellow area. And so they're always going to show up in the red, the red channel is where that's going to be. So you have to really pay attention uh, to that uh, particular channel. And yeah, this is just a histogram on an average flower shot. And when you become familiar with uh, histograms and what they're telling you, you can really kind of tell what an image looks like just by looking at the histogram. This is a this is a histogram for a this particular image here. It has some brighter areas in it. It has mid-tones in it. It has a little bit of darker areas in it as well uh, in this particular histogram. So it has pretty good contrast and it's not running off the left or right hand side either one. So this would be a good histogram for an image like this that we have. And you know, the brighter parts obviously are gonna be the petals. The mid-tones gonna be a lot of the background 
and probably the center of the flower, the darker parts are out on the edges of this particular one. So learning how to read them can be uh, really, really helpful to getting better shots. And when it comes to this type of photography in particular, anytime I'm talking about a uh, particular genre of photography, I always like to break it down into one or two things that I consider the most important. And when you're working with close-up, macro, even flowers, depth of field becomes the real issue. How are you going to handle it? Uh, how are you going to handle uh, what you're seeing in the image? This uh, two images here, one's at F4, one's at F16. Technically, they're both right. The exposure is good. All that stuff is good, but they're very different images. Uh, and you may like one better than the other, and that's fine. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is a great difference in them, and it may come down sometimes to how you're going to use the image. One of these two images is in the Wildflower book I did a few years ago. And uh, it, uh, if you think about it, you probably figure out which one might be in the Wildflower book uh, and why. It's the F16 because it shows more of the leaf structure, the whole of the flower, even the hairs on the stem. All of that information is there much more prevalent than it is in the other one which is a softer image and you might like it better artistically and that's fine too. Uh, these are the decisions we have to make as photographers and somewhere in between here, there's another image in here around F8 probably somewhere in between these two. And so with digital, where our pixels are free, once we own the equipment, we can shoot as much as we want to. You find a good subject, sometimes it's a good idea to shoot it at several different f-stops and decide later. Uh, and you may have multiple uses for an image. And what's interesting, now this, this is a true macro shot here. This little flower here is maybe a half inch across. Focus point is right in here. Uh, can everybody see my red bouncing ball on here? Does that come across on the screen? Yep, yes. Okay, good. I've never asked that question before. <laughs> I'm sitting here doing it, wondering <laughs> if you can see it. But the focus point is right around in here. Most of your macro lenses are going to have a scale of 2.8 to 32. That's what's going to be on most macro lenses. And what's interesting in this shot is the distance from 2.8 to f32. You think that's a great, great distance in f-stop. But in reality, as far as what's sharp in the image, yeah, the flower is pretty sharp. But if you look right when you get to the back pedal, it's starting to fall off again and it's starting to get blurry again in the background. This leaf right here happens to fall in the same plane, same focal plane as the focal point in here. But what's interesting is look what happens to the background in here with this particular image. So it changes everything when you're going up in the f-stops and how you're getting it. And uh, some of our newer cameras now are showing us what that f-stop looks like in real time. A lot of our older cameras, we had to use the depth of field preview button to stop it down to look and see what it was really going to look like in the end. Uh, both of those things are advantages depending on which ones you have. Because normally looking through a regular macro lens, if it's a 2.8 lens, what you're seeing until you press the shutter is 2.8. Even if you're on aperture priority, you've already put it on F11 or whatever, until you press that shutter, you're not really getting uh, the other thing. So sometimes people end up with the shot that they didn't think they were going to get because they had already changed the f-stop. So... Paying attention to depth of field is the whole thing. And the closer you get, the more critical it is. Uh, both of these images of the dandelion head are at F8. The only difference in the two is where the focal point is. And from the outside to the center of a dandelion head is what? Maybe a half inch, three-eighths to a half inch 
unless they're really, really big. And so that's a difference in the focus point. Very little holding the F8, two really different photographs by moving that focus point just from the leading edge back into the center. So when I'm doing macro work in particular with flowers or anything, I usually focus manually because I want to make sure I get the focus point exactly where I want it uh, when I'm doing it uh, that way. So that's a, a real advantage to focus uh, manually, I think. Our LED screens on the, a lot of our cameras now where we can zoom in and we have touch focusing, touch shooting, all of this stuff, that can be a real advantage too, using the live view uh, on the cameras and really getting in there close uh, to look at some of these things. And I've been doing classes for a long time now, and I, I know that for me, when I go back and I have students come back, I find that they don't really understand how depth of field works. And so spending some time really making sure you understand how depth of field works is really important part of photography in general and particularly in uh, this genre of photography. And there's three different ways it's affected. One is obviously by the actual aperture, same lens, same distance to subject, 1.4 is going to be a lot less depth of field than 5.6, and 16 is going to be a lot more. Focal length also affects it, uh, the focal length of your lens. Same f-stop, same distance to subject, an f-28 28 millimeter lens is going to have a lot more depth of field at 5.6 at that distance than a 50 and way more than a 200. So it crunches down going that way with it. And the third is a function of focusing distance. Same lens, same f-stop. It gets bigger as you move out. The further the, fo your focus, the focus point is, the more five, six will spread out as you're getting. Uh, this is where a lot of you've probably heard the term F8 and B there. This is where that term comes from, because if you're focusing nothing really close, you're out there a little ways, F8 is probably going to get most things sharp because F8 is spread back out when you get it to distance. Whereas if you're really, really close, F8 is not going to be much. The example here is five, six, but it's the same thing as that. My second unbreakable rule and I only have two, light matters, backgrounds matter, and there are no exceptions. I see more photographs that are ruined by the backgrounds than anything else. So paying attention to backgrounds, and especially with our flowers and things like this, close-ups, going to make all the difference in the world. And so when I'm doing this type of photography, I'm always looking at two relationships and they're going to relate to how I apply depth of field. And that's going to be my camera position to subject and my subject to its background. And that's going to determine. Very often I'm looking for backgrounds as much as I'm looking for subjects. With it. And of course, the camera position to the subject is also going to affect how much depth of field I need to get it sharp. In other words, if I'm shooting straight on to a flower, I don't need a lot of depth of field to get that sharp, but if I happen to be shooting at an angle to a larger flower, then it takes a lot more depth of field to get it all sharp, which is going to in turn bring the back, uh, create more issues with the background. So these are the relationships that I'm always looking at uh, when I'm doing that. And this is one of the reasons that I like the longer focal lengths when I can use them to photograph this kind of subject matter because it narrows the field of view. It narrows the background. Uh, macro lenses and focal length, you can probably find them in 60, 100, and 200, and it's working distance. You take the same subject with a 60 millimeter, but that's going to have a pretty wide background coverage. If you move away to 100, 
take the same. It gets narrower, and by the time you get out to 200 or 300, you have a very narrow background to try to control. That's one of the reasons I like to use the longer lenses when I can, even if they're not macro lenses. And so the camera angles and position is how I really control all of this. And if we look at the three examples here, uh, the azalea head over here uh, at the top left, what's going on here, that's a bigger flower head. It's shot at actually at F11. But there's the one that I picked has nothing behind it for about five feet. So I get most of the wall of the flower pretty sharp and the background fades the way I want it to. The lower left, well, this is a much tighter area, much smaller flowers, and I'm shooting straight onto them. So I don't need a lot of depth of field to get it sharp across the plane here. And I can still blur the background. Not totally, but enough to do it. The rock pink on the right-hand side, this is one that grows in some of the pools and solution pits on Stone Mountain. And it's on a tall, thin stem, about a foot high usually. And it's a tough one in the wind to begin with. But there's a lot of things going on around it. So if you really look at it, you can tell that I'm shooting from a lower angle up toward the flower. And when I did that, I isolated everything that was around it. It's no longer in the frame. The closest thing behind it is the forest. It's about 10 yards behind it. There's nothing close behind this at all. It's all way behind it. So I can use whatever depth of field I need here as close to get this sharp and still blur the background. So that those two positions or what I'm working with all the time uh, when I'm doing this. I mentioned the diffusers. This is an example of what I want to do with a diffuser when I'm using it. It's got later in the day, the light's real harsh. I've got a lot of high contrast shadows. I want to use a diffuser just to soften all of that light back out. That way I get rid of the harsh shadows. I've still got a nice uh, light, even light on the flower. So that's how I would use the diffuser. The reflectors, a lot of our flowers in the field are gonna be leaning over very often or they have deep dark centers that we need a little light in like down here where it's kind of dark up on the upper edge in here. And a simple reflector, that silver reflector I showed can just bounce just a little bit of light back up here and open that up. And it makes a big difference in the final image of what it's gonna look like. This is another flower shot at a low angle to control the background as well with this. I didn't mention the squirt bottle. I always have a little box squirt bottle of water with me in my pack in the field. And just the 99 cent ones from the drugstore or Walmart work fine, just plain water. Uh, you know, it just adds another look to it. Uh, you know, if you don't have like been very dry lately, so... Anything you have, if you want another look to it, you can use the squirt bottle. I don't recommend add doing anything other than just plain water uh, when you're doing this. It uh, This is not a great example of this, but water actually does several things. For a lot of things, it will make the colors really pop. If they're kind of dry and dull, wet flowers, the colors will pop. Third thing it does, when I said earlier, our biggest enemy is wind. Wet flowers are heavier than dry flowers. Uh, so it can be a little bit of an assist in that category too. Number of things it does. <clears throat> Don't forget your basic composition rules when you're doing close up and macro work. Uh, the tendency is obviously to bullseye everything. So the old rule of thirds is still really good to apply when you're doing this. Uh, if you think about the image on the left, if this were in the center, I don't think it would be as interesting an image to me uh, anyway. And then the upper one here, positioning the flower here to open up into the frame here in this and show more of the whole thing, I think works really well here. 
So position, you know, lines, colors, textures, all of those things. You want to think about those when you're getting close to and our tendency really is to bullseye. But uh, background control, I mentioned that, I'll mention that again. And very often background control is simply a matter of moving. Just shifting your position can be higher or lower. It can be left and right just a little bit. But it goes to really paying attention to what's happening in the background. I don't find this particularly disturbing because it is obviously another columbine that's in the background here. But by simply shifting my position a little bit, I can move it out of the frame of the picture that I'm taking here with that. And so very, very often background control is all about movement, your movement. Getting closer, this is another one I see in my classes a lot when they bring macro shots in. They're not really macro shots. They didn't get close enough. Uh, so make sure whatever lenses you're using, you know just how close you can get in to images uh, or different scenes. And then you can have horizontals, verticals, lots of different ways of approaching it that you can get into. But get close. And training yourself to look for little problems when you're dealing with flowers. I can't tell you how many flower photos I have where I got home and looked at them and said, dang, where did that wormhole come from? Or I didn't see that missing petal or that bad leaf that was in here. That's a little bit of a distraction. Also, when you're working with the depth of field, watch for hot spots. Because as I said, if you're looking through a lens at 2.8, you may not see this. But then if you shoot it at F11, there it is. It shows up in the background. So learning to look for these things. And, you know, we're focusing on a small area and you think, well, what can I miss? There's not much here, but there's a lot going on in there, a lot that can be missed when you're doing it. Learning to pre-visualize the old Ansel Adams adage, pre-visualize what you're going to do with something in the end. Uh, this is a very large flower. Those of you who are familiar with lotus flowers, this thing's probably more than a foot across. But straight out of the camera, this is the image over here that was taken. But thinking about it, I knew several things. I had an idea what I wanted my final image to be. And I, I knew that I had a high contrast subject between the flower and the background. I knew that I wanted the flower, and I was probably going to crop this square to begin with. So I wanted to make sure I got all of the flower, which meant I was going to have more up here and more down here that I didn't really want, but that's okay. I had all of the flower. Uh, now, this is a good time to mention, hopefully everybody knows that your cameras now, most all of the modern DSLRs and mirrorless, you can actually change the aspect ratio that you're shooting in. You can shoot square, you can shoot four thirds, you can shoot uh, nine to 16, more panoramic. So you could actually shoot this square uh, if you wanted to uh, with this. But I knew that I had the information here that I wanted and I had an idea what I wanted to do with it. And I knew that once I got it into post-processing, because it was such a high contrast, I could very, very easily fade the background to black. I had pumped the color up just a little bit in some of the tips, and then there's a certain amount of sharpening going on. Really very simple, probably not more than four or five minutes to do this in post-processing because I was thinking in the field what I was going to do with it and had what I needed uh, to do it. We don't think black and white with flowers, but sometimes that works very well too. And uh, you you can uh, do this in post-processing very well. A lot of programs out there that do it. Photoshop does it as well as anything uh, with that. And uh, you can also, uh, this is another one I find that a lot of people don't realize. We're all shooting raw all the time, most of us. But if you shoot raw plus JPEG and you go into your picture styles and change it to monochrome, the JPEG will be a black and white image. The raw file will still be a color file. And you have the best of both worlds to work at. 
plus when you're shooting it you're going to see the review image will be black and white and you'll have an idea of what you what might work as a black and white image and what might not uh, very well when you're doing it uh, so uh, and some of the cameras make really good in-camera black and white uh, as well so you have some of those th things to work at so kind of wrapping up here some of these flower macro tips uh, use a tripod don't forget about your lighting your depth of field your backgrounds where are you putting your point of focus manual works very well a lot of times that's my number seven here composition rule of thirds and if you're going to use a tripod, you might as well use a remote release as well. Keep your hands off of it altogether as much as you can. Insect tip, early. Best time for photographing insects is early. They have to warm up. They can't. Everybody's probably seen those one of those photos of dew-covered moths and things. Always going to be early, obvious. And learning to see when you're walking around in the field, I see people walk by good shots all the time because they're always in a hurry to get from point A to point B and they're not looking at what's in between. So slow down in the field uh, when you're doing this kind of stuff. A uh, few images here right at the end is stuck in here. Uh, favorite places to do this kind of photography. A lot of you are probably aware of them. I showed... The lotus flowers were from Perry's Water Garden up in Franklin, North Carolina. Uh, a lot of these are from the Botanical Gardens in Gainesville or Atlanta. Gibbs Gardens, of course, everybody's familiar with. The State Botanical Gardens over in Athens. Our granite outcrops are very, very good. This is a yellow daisy from Stone Mountain. Uh, and that's one of my favorite places to do this kind of photography. Uh, Stone Mountain Yellow Daisies are having a good year. It's great. Arabia is great uh, as well. So just a few shots here. It's on the south side of Stone Mountain. In a good year, they're just everywhere. It's really one of the great wildflower displays around. You're doing it. So, And I always give my plug as the whole put my Sierra Club hat back on for a minute. And, you know, just, just encourage you when you're out there shooting, uh, nature first, uh, take photographs, leave footsteps. Don't mess with things if you don't know what they are uh, in the field. And uh, don't do not do what happened up here during COVID. The trash just got, everybody went to the woods and they trashed every place. So, uh, you know, take your, take your trash home. Uh, quick plug for uh, next year, my uh northern new mexico workshop uh august 13 to 19. we're going to be in the higher elevations this time for the fall color on the aspens really great i did that year before last fantastic some of the great landscape scenes anywhere and i'll be back in new mexico and for bella uh bosque del apache white sands in december of next year for the bird migrations and also some great landscape opportunities there as well uh, with that and I do have to plug since I represent them if you're not familiar with Hunt's photo and video I mentioned the the LED light there's a lot of specials they have as well so check them out call Alan if you're looking for anything tell him I sent you there and that's it so hopefully that's been somewhat interesting it be extremely interesting Anybody got any questions? <clears throat> I think you did a good job, Larry. Thank you. Larry, I, I've got one. Okay. I, I always hear of the debate of macro lenses versus extension tubes versus reversing your lens. Have, do, do you have experience with using extension tubes? And are they as good as macro lenses? Uh, yes and no. The problem with extension tubes that I've always had is working distance. Uh, because you're, you're, so I playing with close up filters to some degree. You're getting, you're really getting in closer and closer. And at some point, working distance becomes a problem. Uh, reverse lenses 
kind of the same thing. And he only used those for really real macro things. I do. And because of the electronics uh, and, you know, when you reverse the lens, you're not, the lens and body are not talking to each other. So you either have to, it's an electronic lens, you've got to trick it into stopping down on the aperture or shoot it wide open on, uh, on most of them. Whereas if you can find, I found the uh, old Leica 50 millimeter lens at a yard sale and I paid like 15 bucks for it. It's perfect condition. And it has the manual aperture on it that you can actually turn it with the old aperture ring. And uh, so that's the one I use for reverse mounting. But your first question um, back to the extension tubes, uh, usually the one uh, that I'll use, if I use it, will be the shorter one, the 12 millimeter usually, because when I go beyond that, I just find that the walk, working distance just gets too short. That's my experience with it. Thank that's you. great. Thank you, Larry.